Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. After that, we I went back to Los Angeles, broke, no money, and um Another friend of mine called and said that the Gap Band was going out on tour and they wanted that Bride of Funkenstein sound, right? Everybody wanted the Brides of Funkenstein sound. They did. They wanted that sound. Everyone did. And everyone tried to emulate it and get it as well. And some of them did pretty good, good jobs of duplicating the sound. But Charlie Wilson basically said to me, uh, I want the, the Brides of Fun I want that Bride of Funkenstein sound while going out on tour. And he asked me, was I, what did I want to go? And I needed a job. So I said, yes, that's how I got with them. And how, in what principal ways would you say was the vibe different in that camp versus P-Funk camp? Well, in any, any organization or any band that you work with, regardless of P-Funk is going to be different. And if, you, if you're holding, uh, comparing the musicians and the music to the funk, the hardcore rock funk to any R&B group, I'm always going to be uh, biased because to me, there was nothing in the world as great as probably the Funkadelic then and now. So even though the Gap Band was an exceptional uh, uh, group and they had some Charlie wasn't a phenomenal singer and his, his two brothers were equally as talented. Um, it was just something that wasn't the same. It wasn't it. What was missing for me is that wall of vocal sound that P-Funk had, you know, for, for me, for me, uh, being in my slot on the stage, I always felt empty over there singing, singing background vocals. I always felt like it was not full enough to me. I was never um, satisfied because I always felt like something was missing. And then for me, it was it was the, the background, the vocals, the vocals, uh, that wall of sound was missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Gap Band, um, I mean, they made a living uh, picking up that like flashlight type of Moog funk sound and just turning into so many hits. Um, yeah, they, they did pretty good. You know, they emulating, duplicating, they, they did, they did. They sounded, uh, everybody was doing that. It wasn't just the Gap Band doing that. All the groups were doing it. George Duke, Duke did it probably the best to me personally um, with, with his, with his uh, reach, uh, funk. Reach, reach for it. Yeah. Reach for it was straight Funkadelic, okay? Probably Funkadelic. Yeah. So, yeah. And then the Gap Band actually took uh, Disco to Go, you know, the horn lines, right? Oops, Upside Your Head was to me, they flipped the, the, the groove. They flipped the rhythm around the same chord structures. They flipped it and they took the, uh, the horn lines from disco to go, uh, that, that Fred Wesley and, uh, Maceo, Fred, I think Fred Wesley charted out those horn lines for the brides of Funkenstein, but they took that and they opened their show with that, which they still open their shows to, the, to this, to this day with that, the brides of Funkenstein's, uh, biggest selling record was disco to go. And I think they, the, um, the Gap Band fell in love with the uh, that music. Uh oh, I got Jeff Bunn calling me. Hold up, Cherokee. Yeah, that's Cherokee. I'll get back to. Him. It's like Jeff Bunn. See, Jeff. There you go, Jeff Bunn. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call you back, baby. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, the um, yeah that made me feel funny standing on stage and 
knowing that they started the song with went to Disco to Go. They started their shows rather with Disco to Go and uh they didn't acknowledge you know where it came from or, or who I, I'm standing on stage you know behind them and they never did acknowledge that that was my song you know and I just uh, it made me feel every night I felt robbed you know and I've, I've never said that I didn't even say that in the book I've never yeah, I always I, I never said credit there for sure it sounds like yeah I I felt I felt night after night I felt robbed and you're talking nine years I was with Gap Band for nine years and and it never went away Every night, every time we did a show, and then Gap Band did a whole lot of shows, quite a few. And every night, I always felt robbed, and never went away. And they played it so much in the beginning. Some of the the funk fans and that knew about the brides, they knew that they were doing an interlude. It's like, didn't that? Doesn't that? Don't those horn lines come from disco to go? I used to hear that a lot when the shows were over. And then as time went by, people stopped doing that, and they forgot where it came from. And I never, but I never forgot. I never forgot. Ironically, for the Gap Band, or just ironically in general, later on, I think Bruno Mars got in trouble for, you know, sounding like the Gap Band, and then the Gap Band had taken it from the Brides, and you know. Yeah, but then you know what I what I I wasn't really that mad at the Gap Band as as opposed as I was to the Funk Organization for not fighting for us again. Because that was ours, that was our song, that was my, my our debut. That was our, you know, that was our debut song out the gate, right? That's the song that that blew up for the Brides of Falkenstein that put the Brides of Falkenstein on the map. And that song was written um, by Bootsy and, and and George, and I just always felt like someone should have fought harder for us and and, and went after them because that's what you called a. It's called a what an interpolation. You just can't take somebody's track, literally, that they took the horn lines. They did. And just claimed it. And no one said or did anything about it at all. Not in the trades, not anything. Nobody was fighting or sniveling or whining about it except me. Mm. And then it still breaks my heart to this day because they're still going out and you, you can go to, a, I haven't gone to a Gap Band or a show in years, but the last time I went, maybe four or five years ago, and they started the show with the disco to go. <laughs> so that still made me feel the same way, you know? So I was like, do you just be quiet and don't say anything about it? Or do you write about it in your book? And I wrote about it in the book. And I stand by everything I wrote, everything. Just talking about that, Don, and like getting ideas and maybe not giving credit, it, it reminds me of in your book, you also talk about... Um, new birth influence on, uh, you know, the mothership concept and, and influencing George and Parliament and maybe people. I didn't know about that until I read in your book. So really? Yeah. Well, I, um, I really, the first time I heard it, it was from a guy named James Baker and James Baker was, a I believe he played keyboards and a trumpet player for new birth. And, uh, I don't know if he was in the night lighter camp or not, but I know that we were really good friends. I met James Baker after the Sly and the Family Stone show at the Shrine Auditorium. New Birth at that time was playing at the Total Experience on Crenshaw. And they were one of the first groups that played two nights, two shows a week for seven solid days. I mean, Monday through Monday or Sunday through Sunday is what it was. Two nights. They played 14 shows back to back. All of them sold out. I don't think any group has ever done that. I think maybe Shaka and Rufus, Rufus featuring Shaka Khan at that time, played the Total Experience Crenshaw and did the same thing. They sold out 14 shows. I mean, Sunday through Sunday. So I heard, you know, when, when the show was over at the Shrine Auditorium, you're talking winter 74, I believe it was. And, um, my aunt was going to see New Birth, and so she picked me up from the shrine, and we go over to to the uh, Total Experience on Crenshaw, and standing in line, I didn't realize at the time that the show was already sold out. We wouldn't have gotten in anyway, right? But this tall guy with the big giant afro walked up to me and said, "If you if you want to get into the show, come with me." So we followed him, and he moved it moved the chain, and we walked into the venue, and that's how I met. 
James Baker and my James Baker and my relationship that began with new birth. So fast forward a few years down the line when uh, now I've not with Sly anymore. I'm with P Funk and then the Brides of Funkenstein had gotten our first contract, right? I had a contract and James Baker knew the ins and outs of the music industry back and forth. And we went out to lunch and he basically told me the story about how uh, he believes that um, the Funkadelic, probably Funkadelic, stole the concept of the mothership connection from new birth. You know, uh, I was totally in denial. I mean, back then, I was like, no, no, they didn't. It's like, you know, the whole mothership thing. I was part of the mothership. You know, I was, I was, I was gig, you know, I was square, right? One of the bionic idiots. Oh, how dare you, just, you know, talk about my Funkadelic like that. I, I chose not to believe him. He was so angry. Um, but I had the contract and I showed it to him. He told me not to sign it. It was a slave contract and blah, blah. But he talked about how, you know, and I remember, I've never seen a New Birth live show. I've never gone before. I was kind of young back then when they first came out. So my mom probably wouldn't have let me go to any of their shows. But no, I take that. I was married at the time. I had a husband that wasn't going to let me go see New Birth. So I think they came out like, what, 70? I can't remember the date. Was it 70? Is it 75? I don't remember. But I do remember that they used to come three big giant eggs it used to come down from the uh, from the ceiling and these big eggs were coming from outer space and they would crack open and then the lead singers would come out of those eggs and come to the front of the stage but they were extraterrestrials and uh according to, to James Baker um um funkadelic or probably funkadelic used to open up for new birth and also, uh, it was a sh special guest was uh, LaBelle. They went out on, t on tour together. LaBelle, Parliament Funkadelic, and, uh, and New Birth. And New Birth was the headliners. And then I think that was around the time when they were pushing George out on the stage in a coffin, right? So shortly after those, the, the tour ended, the mothership gave birth to with George coming out of the spaceship and coming up with a whole extraterrestrial concept. But that concept, the extraterrestrial concept, basically, now that I realize that it's that's there's some there's quite a bit of uh, truth to that. Where New Birth did come up with the extraterrestrials first, with them landing on stage from out of space, and I, I mean, I wish I could have seen the those eggs hatching on stage, but I, I never did. Um, also, with LaBelle, with the costumes and the headpieces and the silver boots and um, I think he borrowed, George borrowed a little bit from both groups, LaBelle and uh, New Birth. And I did talk about that, you know, again in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating stuff. I mean, th I mean, think about it. You look at the costumes, you look at the song, one of the songs that LaBelle wrote called uh, uh, Space Children, which is the derivative of Cosmic Slot, right? Same, the lyrics are just about the same. So it is what it is. I, I would have to give George the edge in terms of he's, he took it and, and, and enhanced it, right? He even made it more at more animated than they did. So I can't take that away from, from that creative part of, of, of George. But um, the, I think the, the idea probably was hatched without a new birth, literally. Hatched. Yeah. Hatched. <laughs> the eggs, yeah. Hatched. Yeah, literally yeah. hatched. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I got to say, you know, as a funk warrior, um, and commiserating as a fellow funk warrior, or at least funk soldier, uh, you know, I, I just wrote about this recently, and I'm sure you're passionate about it too. Looking at the Grammys for this year, there's like almost a hundred categories and there's not a funk category. And just with the, the rock and roll hall of fame overlooking funk bands and, and the demise of funk bands and that whole situation, I just feel like it's like a, a systematic, you know, kick to the curb situation with funk and why, and what can we do about it to, to, 
you know, help funk get its rightful place. We've been, I think we've been fighting to get funk back to its rightful place for a while. I think maybe the industry may have was, was afraid of the funk because at one time when I was blessed, actually it's a blessing for me to be there when the funk was the biggest genre in the world. When Parliament Funkadelic was at the top of the charts, um, with the whole mothership connection, the the needies, the One Nations, and the Taylor Roof Offs, and successions of hit record after hit record after hit record, uh, they pretty much you know had a monopoly on the industry with all the different groups. That's why it saddens me saddens me to, to today that it shouldn't it should have been like a the funk would have like Clinton. Let's just go back to George should have been the Quincy Jones of the of, of the funk right now. I think the funk would have been unstoppable if we weren't suppressed. So we had a lot to do with ourselves and the demise of our own journey, right? I believe that. But the industry at the time, because funk cannot be replicated, the funk, just because it's funky doesn't mean it's the funk. There's, there's a difference, you know, just like, you know, not, you know, my book. Uh, I remember Ricky Vincent saying that I was a game changer and I set the bar high. And, uh, I don't think he realizes, but maybe so. He's a scholar, you know, um, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a guru of the funk. I added a new category to my book and it's called the history of funk rock. That category does not exist. And and before my book, it didn't exist now. And so because I came up with the history of funk rock, and I now have a Dewey Decibel number where my book is in the libraries in several counties, they put my book sandwiched in between John Lennon, the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Dolly Parton, Carly Simon, Willie Nelson, and others, and right there on the shelf with my Dewey Decimal number because I came up with the category called the history of funk rock is the funk queen, sandwiched in between John Lennon and the Rolling Stones to today. So that's uh, maybe I went through the side door and the back door and sneak and snuck it in, but that's what I did. And before, I mean, there was a lot of publishing companies that basically said there's no genre for funk rock. There is no genre, as you know, for funk, period. But that is by design. That's not that's not a fluke. We've been uh, trying to get the funk as a category. I mean, hip hop has a category now, right? But if it wasn't for the funk, there would be no hip hop. Mm-hmm. So they, they flip that around and make it look like the, the hip hop saved the funk. No, it's backwards. They sampled the funk. They blew up with sampling derivatives of the funk, which was familiar, similar, and they were hit records. So all you have to do is put a little, put a, you know, spit a beat across it and then it blows back up. So personally, uh, um, it's the other way around. But long story short, the funk, because it's, you can't replicate it. You can't dim- duplicate it. You can't emulate it. And for those, some of the groups like the Gap Band who were able to do that, they had a lot of hit records because of it. But everybody can't do that. And so you play a R&B pop song on the radio, then play some hardcore funk, the funk afterwards. And then it's, the song before is going to be rendered weak in comparison. That's the reason why. I mean, if you go on the... A, sh- a show like a, you do a, con- a concert or a show or a music show or whatever, and then you have an uh, you have a, a, a the Parliament Funkadelic, for example, the OG Parliament Funkadelic. They go up on stage and they do a performance and they play a couple of their hit records. No group can follow that because you don't blew them off the map. So I think they may be uh, afraid of that market. But I think it's it's a genre that should not should should come back to mainstream music. Not saying that it never was, because it one at one time was mainstream, and it got now it's been suppressed. And again, that is by design. 
That's why this is like a, a cannon shot, you know, to get attention not only to you and your in your great story, but just the funk in general. Um, well, you know, the funk is um, to me, uh, it's regal, right? It's a uh, noble. It's royalty. It's like uh, I said that the other night on an interview. It's the Rolls Royce of the music industry. So my book had to be of the highest quality down to the paper it's written on, right? So it's just like I, another thing to, to coin uh, Ricky Vince where he says, looks like the pictures are jumping out at you in that book is because of the quality of the paper. The, the paper alone cost me a fortune just for the paper and the words that it's written on. And it just feels silky to your hand. But then I had to do that because it is the phone. I couldn't, I didn't want to cheapen what that art form is because it's of the highest. It's royal blood. The funk is, it's regal. It's noble. Well, it is and the and it's just so unjustly gotten short shrift, you know, by the industry itself in so many ways. So for you to stand tall like that, you know, in its honor is just, so special to all of us funketeers so we're just so well, it's special to too Scott, because it's like a, um it's spiritual it's from the heart and i you know i don't know if we're i'm probably i'm sure i'm older than you i'm older than everybody <laughs> i grew up with the um with the best music in the world and we had an outlet for us as we if we didn't have a good day at school if we were in a situation where we're stressful situation situation whatever it is we always had our music right we could go home and listen to our music and get lost into whatever we were going through and instead of you going and reaching for drugs you had your music and that was my drug and it still is but today they don't have that anymore it's, it's just missing so I want to be able to do the same thing for a lot of the, the next generation and the generation after that coming to, to let them understand what this art form is because they're being cheap, um, cheated. They don't really know. They, they don't really know what the funk really is. So I try to do everything in my power to come up with the, with the same formula and the music and the groups. It's, not, it's complicated. It's not that easy to do. And sometimes I, I set the bar even too high for myself. I did that with all my funky friends CD 23 years ago when I put 10 singles on one CD and everybody kept asking me why I was doing that. Right. Why did I, why did I do that? And I, I did it because I didn't want to cheapen uh, the quality of, of the music. And I, I think that the, the music industry, the, the record companies, they take two or three songs that are hits and put it on the record and the rest of that stuff's fillers. And to me, that's 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 cheating. I I didn't want I didn't want to do that. I put ten records. I put ten singles on there, and that's why that CD. Twenty three years later, after I sold a quarter of a million of those out of my kitchen, I did. Twenty three years later, I just picked up a, a major, huge marketing and a publishing deal out of uh, London, which is going to tap into the Ivory Coast, Africa to China to India. Uh, and Europe, that's dropping next week. The same CD, because somebody heard it for the first time a couple of months ago. One of the uh, people over at this company out of London heard it for the first time. So that just tells you that the song was, it, the album is 23 years old, but the songs are 20 years old before I even put them on there. <laughs> songs are 43 years old. And so why is that noble? Why is it regal? Why? Because it is the funk the funk stands the test of time yes it does time is and, and that was really interesting too to read in your book just about you know what you went through to get this out there you know that was just an amazing story in of itself it is yeah there was a, the same old suppression of of this art form that you, like i said if you can't control it then you're gonna what are you gonna do you're gonna basically um try to bury it right now did you did, did you uh were you a, a journalist and uh or journaler or whatever 
did you throughout your life and your your career just keep notes and things because your recall and your detail is just amazing uh i started keeping a journal diary actually when i was in the third grade my mother was a journalist uh uh not professional she never had anything published but she was a history major and so was my dad so she gave me a tablet when i was in the third grade i mean uh, i mean a real tablet <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a pencil and she started telling me to write down a lot of words and uh what they meant because uh and i talked about that in the earlier part of my book as well um uh just every every time i wanted to remember something i would i would write write it down and i'd go back to her and then she would say well what street was it on what time of day was it what was the weather like um what time of year was it um what was the crowd like? What was the, 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 how was it warm? Was it cold? Was it hot? Was it snowing? Was it raining? So when, when you write a story, you have to, you want to people to, to pull them in. So it feels like they're actually on that same journey with you. And so I started uh, probably mastering that. And by the time I got in the seventh grade, I had a, I had an English teacher who basically told me that I had a flair for words and a gift of putting putting uh, stories together and that I should master it. And I took some creative course writings and um, at city college here in Sacramento and um, studied as much as I could, but mostly under my mom. And then by the time I you know, started thinking about writing a book uh, and all the journal, I still had a box. My mother saved all of that stuff. You know, my mom passed away and I was going through um, her things and I found them. She kept them all and started putting them all together. And, Back to the beginning of the book, I uh, we didn't have a television set again. We only had her stories, and and uh, she would tell us a bedtime story every night. And so I started the book about my uh, indigenous uh, heritage, his bloodline on both sides, which was uh, my father's side was uh, Seminole, which is not really Seminole; it's Choctaw. And um, on my uh, mother's side, Blackfoot, Red Stick Creek, and Tusa Gully Cherokee. And then she told me about her grandfather who his family basically um lived in the caves up in the smoky mountains right and that um he was born in those caves and i think that they were those stories were passed on from the the trail of tears where a whole lot of the indigenous uh escaped but they escaped and they landed up they stayed up in the smoky mountains along the tennessee border north carolina tennessee border and one of those survivors was a was a a man named Red Stick to Sagali, who, who was my great grandfather. And so he would tell my mother's stories. And then those stories got passed on to me about the hardships of between um, 1860 and 1888, where it was the hardest time, the most dangerous time for a living um, indigenous native in America, because they were basically systematically eliminating them and of, uh, and then we had they had a government that was actually made it legal for you to hunt them down and kill them. So my great grandfather who lived in those caves, when he was 12 years old, he went fishing. And when he came back to the cave, his entire family was brutally murdered. So he came he came down. Of course, the militia was now looking for him for whatever reason, but they were looking for him. And the dark skins, which were freed slaves that lived in those parts, as my mother said, used to hide him in the walls of their cabins. So he would go from farm to farm for years, hiding and crouched down on the walls because the militia looked for him for years. But that, but the uh, the freed slaves in those parts basically uh, saved his life, and they used to hide him. So eventually, they forgot all about you know the, the little Indian boy, and they uh, he grew up and he got married and married to, into a family, and he had children, and then um, my mother was a was a product of that of that. Uh, uh, marriage and so at five years old she he started telling her at five years old uh, uh, all these stories and she remembered them so when I was seven eight years old she started telling me those stories and I started writing them down so the, the hardships that the indigenous Kate went through is just so brutal and it was it touched my heart so deeply and now they're starting to actually talk about what what uh, America has done to these uh these tribes they split them all it just basically the whole divide and conquer thing, but um, 
as far as the Red Stick Creek. I studied the, I didn't really do, do the, the research on them. After my mother had passed away by then and I was so upset because I wanted to ask her more questions and she's gone. But I did the research on the Red Stick Creek and found out that she, they, they go back thousands of years. At the Red Stick Creek and the Tusagali Cherokees go back, what, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 years. So I did the research and found out that by the time that they were living in those caves where my grandfather was, all they had left to fight with was rocks and sticks. And that's how they got the name, the Red Stick Creek. Then you flip over to going back to the 15th century on my dad's side in Louisiana in New Orleans with the Acadian French. Uh, I went all the way back to the 15th century and did my research on them too. And that's my dad's side and found out that the Acadian French got kicked out of London because they refused to bend the knee to the queen. So then she deported them. They ended up going to Quebec and uh, Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia is where also the underground railroad to the funk, where all of the freed slaves or the slaves, runaway slaves, when they got to Canada, they took them to Nova Scotia. So in 1755, those 10,000 Acadian French that left in the 15th, 16th century, they migrated to New Orleans, Louisiana. So I did their research on all of that and wrote it and put it in my book in the first four or five chapters. And, um, I thought that that would encourage or inspire others to do the same thing like I did. If, you know, I don't know too many black Americans or white Americans as well that do not have indigenous on both sides of their families. So I, I did that. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why the book is now not just the funk queen. The book is now being called an academic masterpiece and several universities are picking up that book and putting in their libraries where I'm going to be going out and doing lectures, not so much on the funk, but on the on the lineage and the background of the indigenous, my indigenous bloodline. So yeah, this this book is like a it's like the All My Funky Friends album. It's just like, it's just like it's just a it's a journey. And then I just took my entire life from the third grade and I just put it all in one book. And then the Underground Railroad to the funk is the connection did you ever whereas well whereas <laughs> i got a proclamation whereas i got a proclamation from the city of Folsom, you know honoring don silva uh with the proclamation to the as the underground railroad uh because now in america september is underground railroad month did you know that can't say i did I just found out myself when they gave me that. They gave me the proclamation in September, and then they put my took my book, and they put it in their libraries. And so once I got a Dewey Decimal number, and then because I put back, we come full circle on this conversation because I put the history of funk rock in the category of my book. That's why it's standing on the shelf between John Lennon and the Rolling Stones. Boom, the funk queen. <laughs> wow. Uh did you ever in your wildest imagination realize the impact that your book might end up having and the response it would get? No, I mean, I mean what it's going to get or what it has already done. If it stops selling today, it's just, it's blown me away on what it's doing right now, basically because, you know, books, um, they're not like songs, you know, you keep playing them over and they, they're around for, several months this books i think the lifespan of, of a really good books maybe about two months maybe six weeks two months uh especially on social networks because we don't read anymore and everybody keeps asking me for um uh, ebooks or audiobooks or uh kindles which i didn't do any of that because i i want everybody to get back to reading <laughs> it was kind of hard to put all of that information uh you know in a pretty much in a in a audio book that's a lot of reading so but i i wanted to keep the integrity of that book all and make it a classic edition that's why there's only 1500 copies once those 1500 are gone you won't be able to get that book anymore you might can get a derivative or a watered down or a standard book let me show you the standard books like these are standard books which and i'm a reader i read all the time thanks to my mom but i have this one for sly of course you have yours and this book um 
co-signs a lot of what I wrote in part two, Sly and the Family Stone. So I'm honored that Sly says so many wonderful things about me in this book, and he co-signed a lot of the stories I wrote. This is a standard size, and this one is one of my first ones I got. Well, second, wait a minute. This is the first book I bought with Ricky Vincent, okay? That one, that's my treasure. It's beat up, you know, I studied this one. Uh, and then I got Fred Hit Me, Fred, right? And that's another one. It was a little complicated because I'm not a horn player, so I didn't, this was great for, for jazz musicians, and this is a great book. And then this one, the basic what I'm trying to say is that that's the standard size of the books. Publishing companies don't want to do table books anymore, right? So because I, when I started putting my book together with the 300 photos, it wouldn't close. <laughs> you know, when it was this size, they couldn't bind it closed. It was just because it was too small. So then they said, Dawn, and then they went up the next size and the next size and the next thing I know, this behemoth okay you see the difference between the, the standard and this one and people yeah. want to know what what they're paying for it's like comparing the funk to something that's only funky yeah well they want to know why it costs so much and that's why i mean just a little along the paper the, the pictures the size of it it's it is a coffee table book it's not one of those books you can curl up in bed with it or take on the airplane with you. It's just heavy. You need a suitcase for that book. You, you, need, a, you, need, you need a strong coffee table even. <laughs> yeah, well, mine <laughs> is just like uh, one of my dear friends actually got so uh, enamored by the book. She just couldn't put it down. She says it's one of the, of course, one of the best books she thinks she's ever read. This is what she says. And a lot of people have said that. And that makes me feel really special. But she had to run to the bathroom and she called me up and blamed me because she dropped the book on her foot and she messed up her toe. And then she, it was my fault. And I was like, well, well how's that my fault? <laughs> how's that my fault? Because you dropped the book on your foot, you know? You're but she have to said, have like warnings and disclaimers on it about that. Yeah, well, she wanted <laughs> to know. She said she just wanted to know what happened. And so she took it with her. And I was like, I hear, I hear so many different funny stories that people are telling me with this book. And, uh, it's, it's brought me closer to a lot of the funk soldiers and a lot of them say, now I understand because before I read your book, I, I wondered how the, why the women just disappeared and now they know. Yeah. That story had to be told. Um, before I let you go, I appreciate the time so much, Don. Um, two quick questions. Maybe yes, quick. We'll, we'll see if somebody uh, just, uh, I don't know, fell from outer space or uh, just came out of a uh, cave from somewhere, how would you explain to them what funk is? Well, it's just like trying to explain what a cool breeze feels on your face on a hot day. You know how you're sweating and you're hot and you're, you just can't seem to, to, to get any relief, then all of a sudden this cool breeze blows across your face. Like the wind, that's the phone. It's just like you're just dehydrated and you're thirsty and then you drink a cold glass of water. It's just like air. It's spiritual. It's uh, from the heart. Um, I, I saw some scholars and people who said, made statements like looking for the funk. If you have to search for the funk, are you looking for it? You're never going to find it. You want to know why? inside it's deep inside of you that's the fun mm -hmm. yeah nothing else feels like the fun it's inside of you that feeling where you want to laugh and cry at the same time laugh cry dance at the same time that's the fun and that's what this music does and i actually uh there's a song called voyage to the bottom of the pea which i uh stumbled mutiny. upon it yeah. i stood yeah mutiny by jerome braley's mutiny I stumbled on that song accidentally. I don't know where I was in 1977 when they dropped that song, but this DJ in Paris, France, who used my book for a playlist, he can't read a word of English. And he took my book and he just went to the index and saw all of the names and the, the groups that I mentioned in the book. And then he compiled a playlist together for a two hours show 
And part two is the one that I like the most. And it starts off with mutinies, uh, Jerome Burley's mutiny. And I'm in the kitchen washing dishes and I listened to this and it just like hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, what the fuck is that? You know, so I was, in, I was dancing. I haven't danced all around. I was all out of breath because I'm dancing. I'm dancing and happy. And I played it over and over and over. And then I said, mutiny. You go, mutiny. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. How did I, I, you know, how did I lose this song? I felt so. Like I'm calling myself the funk queen. How is it that I don't know about this song, right? I felt really like bad about it. Okay, it took I took it personal, so I decided I'm gonna go on uh, my social network on Facebook and and do a little shout out commercial to the to the DJ in France, who I am doing an interview with him as well, and the interpreters. He sent me a lot of questions, so he, that should be coming out next month. But I wanted to to thank him for all the hours and time he took to put that together. Hours he had to. With that book, with this book, what is it? Where is it? Here, this book, hours to put the playlist together for the songs. And I mean, it started off with, in the beginning, with the Sam Cooks and the Ray Charles and all of that stuff, right, in this book. But uh, I think Jerome Braley, Jerome Braley, you know, since you brought him up, he's probably the first one that actually kind of spoke out against George and the organization back then. I think that broke his heart to do that, you know, because this is heartbreaking. I, I, we all we love George, and, and I don't know if he sees this. I do, and I I forgiven him a hundred times over, and I don't really know what it was that he was going through at the time. So at the top, if if it was raining bullshit down here at the bottom where I was, I can't even imagine where it was where he was standing. So I don't know why. Some of it is, some of it I do know why, and and it's still heartbreaking the fact that uh. Maybe he didn't have a choice. I, I would really like to to know for sure. I really would one day to to to, to try to under put a reason to all of it without me coming up with my own, you know, my own uh, assertions. But the fact is, is that I, I experienced it and I lived it, and a lot of it was not didn't have to happen that way. But with Jerome Braley, yeah, he spoke out and I know it hurt him. And I know that he loves the funk just as much as we all do. And uh, at the time, and I was sitting on that bus when they did that mutiny. I was right there. Lynn and I had just got in the group. And I was devastated because I was just beginning to fall in love with all of them. And I love my job so much. And just the fact that to think that it was going to be, oh, it was that night it was going to be over. It broke. I couldn't even uh, hardly breathe that night. I remember I was so distraught that when they had that mutiny, like, oh, my God, is this it? I never wanted it to end to this day. I still don't. But yeah, but back to the mutiny song, when I did hear that, that is the, the, the perfect formula for funk rock. That is perfect. And then uh, it's not the Bruno Mars uptown funk, which he kind of sprinkle it you know he tapped into it a bit and that was a great song i like that song but that it was funky but that wasn't the funk and i was waiting for him to follow up with something similar disappointed that i didn't hear anything similar that came from that but this uh new streaming deal that i have there's a new market called new funk that's blowing up in ivory coast but they're all emulating uptown funk by bruno mars when they should be emulating tear the roof off mm. or you know, t- you know standing on the verge of getting it on cosmic slop or that's or red hot mama that's what they should be emulating because that's the funk not counting the brides what's your favorite p-funk album of all time <sighs> now she didn't got me on the spot there so you should have told me you're gonna ask that question <laughs> You can take your my, time. I can my my favorite. Ooh, yeah, uh, if you had to go on a desert island, you can only have one P Funk album. The one that has needy. That's Uncle Jim. There it is, needy. Because you can't be without that track. Mm-mm. Uh, my I was like when I leave this earth, you know, on my when my send off, you know, I want you to play needy. I love it. Okay, I want everybody to celebrate. Needy. And have to be that one. Then, of course, uh, Aqua Boogie. And then 
the Mothership Connection Live with uh, Glenn Goins on Swing Down, Sweet Chariots, of course. But yeah, if I had to choose just the one album, I would take Uncle Jam with me. That would be the one. Um, so what what do you have lined up in early 2024? I'm going to to uh, be doing lectures. The, the first one starts in March 9th at UC Irvine at the Winfred Smith Hall, I believe it is. And there's a panel of four women that are talking about the funk. They're talking, and it's this is all given birth since they put my my book in the library at UC Irvine. Um, we're talking, that book has, uh, uh, launched a panel for women to talk about the funk. So they basically got Jeanette Washington from, from Parlet. They got myself, another lady called, uh, Maxie from the Mary Jane girls. And she's going to be representing the, the Mary Jane girls and the, from the Rick James camp. And then they have another lady that's, uh, I, I haven't heard of and She's a rap artist, a, a underground rap artists who basically sampled all of those all of the music from the rick james and the p-funk camp and uh i can't remember her name is terrible right now but then she, that's the four ladies that are going to be on this panel to kickstart the me doing lectures because of this book also uh by the time this interview uh put, you know is is revealed or the time it comes out I will be joining forces with the corporates for the first time in my whole career with Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble has picked up the funk queen. Mm -hmm. And so it will be in any, every Barnes and Noble store across the United States, which now uh, the publishing company that I'm with is independent, but they, because Barnes and Noble has come aboard. Now we have a place to do the book signing and any, and in any city in America that has a Barnes and, and Noble, I can actually just uh, reach out to them a week before the the uh, book signing and let them know, and there you go. And Barnes and Nobles basically has embraced uh, the Funk Queen, and now I probably will be putting together a tour next year to do the Barnes and Nobles uh, uh, book signing runs, and then uh, also in March of uh, 2024, I was just speaking to some of the Funk soldiers from the. The LA maggots, and I know there's about a thousand of them in in uh, Los Angeles, and we're going to be doing the Brides of Funkenstein are going to be doing a concert in Los Angeles to kickstart March in uh with the Brides of Funkenstein and some of the funk groups that are there in uh in um, Los Angeles. My my band, of course, is in Los Angeles, so it's affordable. <laughs> and we're go I'm going back out on tour, you know, because I've been under a uh, quarantine now for three years with the COVID and safe, you know, as you get older, you just don't really want to go anywhere, but to the grocery store. So, but I, I know that it's, if I'm going to go on a funk mission, there's just certain things you can't do from the comfort of my living room. So that's what's happening. The Barnes and Noble book signing, uh, kickstarting, kick, kick starting the Brides of Funkenstein to go back out on the road in Los Angeles and doing the university runs at these colleges. I actually also picked up last week, Michigan University. I picked up Yonkers University in, in Toronto, Canada. I missed the uh, New Orleans uh, at Loyola University. I was supposed to do a lecture there, but I got um, you know a little overwhelmed and wasn't able to make that New Orleans run. So that was disappointing, but I'm gonna make up for it in, in, uh, next year, starting in uh, UC Irvine in March. What will you do when the books run out? Uh, everybody keeps telling me because I'm about to run. I'm close to running out. Uh, I, I'm getting a little nervous because that big old giant I pile I had, uh, they're so huge. They took up a doubles car garage, the, both sides of the garage. I couldn't park the cars in the garage because of the, the books. But now you can park a car in the garage. Now, so I see the other side starting to go down. I was like, uh oh, and people are angry. It's like, why don't you wait? Because they, they're saving the money. So they could get the book and I feel bad. But then this, this book, if Amazon would have took this book, they wanted to charge two and a quarter for it. So that's why I didn't go to Amazon. They wanted too much money for it. So mm -hmm. and I know that the soldiers can't afford that. We're, we're living in some hard times and a hundred dollars is a lot for a book. I've never paid that much for a book, but this one is worth every penny. I believe it didn't, you know, trust me, it is. So 
right now they're talking about doing a ebook, which that is finished, but I never dropped it. An audio book, which I have to start on it. And then of course the Kindle. So I don't know yet. I, I don't want to, you know, cheapen the worth of what this book is. And so I said 1500 limited edition. If, 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 uh, to a lot of people still want to get it, then I'll probably go and do a second run, a second edition, maybe. I don't know yet. But I know that the traditional book, again, the traditional size book, this size, traditional, the small one that, that you know, that you can cuddle up in bed with. That one, I've already had a couple of authors reach out to me and um, want to just take all the pictures out and take out the first eight or nine chapters and condense it down to just a standard book. And to me, I just feel like I'm selling out if I do that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure yet if what I want to yet. It all depends on if they can hold on to the integrity of the book without losing it. Then yeah, then that might be a traditional book so people can afford it. But then of course I feel bad because they didn't get the real one, you know? So that that's too far in the future to to answer that question. I'm not sure yet, Scott. What would you do? I I would probably, if the demand was there, I would do a second run. Um, just yeah. try to make it a little bit different in some way, so you can tell the first run from the second run. Well, there are some pictures in there that I probably would take out, or some of the, the graphic and artwork. There's a story in there too. Well, now that I have, I'm doing this, uh, that I would take out with Lynn, Lynn Mabry, um, about a story, but about her and Junie Morrison, which I basically promised her that I would remove it out of the book because she just didn't want me to put it in there, but it was too late. They had already gone to print with it, but there is a story in there that I stand by tenfold, but the, but she asked me to remove it in because she's my friend and I told her I would. And it was, and it was too late. It had already gone to print. There's a book uh, dropping in the spring of uh, 20, 2024, which is the women of Parliament Funkadelic. And it, it was in that book as, as well, but I, I had uh, Seth Neville, the author, asked him to remove that story. So if I am to do a, a, a new edition or second edition of the Funk Queen, I, I'm definitely going to take that story out with lynn Isn't, and because I, thought she, I, heard, I thought i heard lynn saying she was going to do a book too or no well yeah i think she may be writing one she should i mean we all everybody has a story in them and uh, i'm sure she has an, an incredible story to tell about all of the the groups that she worked with over, over the years i mean some of the phenomenal groups right and lynn played a major role in uh um, and all of those uh, groups, you know, the Talking Heads and Bette Mittler and George Michaels, and she's, she's worked with some of the best. I, I really believe that as great as those groups are that she worked with, she was on the same level as they were. So I always felt like she was shortchanging herself. And I still feel like that to this day because she's such a phenomenal singer and phenomenal artist. You know, I would love to hear Lynn do some stuff on her own, but then that's, that's my own personal feelings about that. She's incredible. But all of those women, all of them that came out of that probably Funkadella camp, all of them could have been a solo artist in their own rights, but collectively, if given a chance, they would have been probably the most powerful women in the world right now. If given a chance. Don't you have some unreleased music too? I do. Yeah, is any of that going to see some light? Yeah, yeah. I, I I was going in the studio and we were rolling along, and like I said, it's quality with me. That's I set the bar too high for myself. And if it's you know if I'm a perfectionist, and if it's something's not right, if it doesn't feel right, and then I just don't want to release it until I can't ask you to pay for something if if I wouldn't pay for it my own self because something's not right or the rhythm's not right or the, the vocal part's not right or the mix isn't right or the tone's not right or something or the horns are not right or something if something is not w working in the track then i'm not going to release it and that's maybe one of my own idiosyncrasies that i need to get over but uh, i have about maybe six very strong songs that i just been started to release them all we started going in the studio like i get 
October 2019. And then the studio I was working at in uh, Los Angeles, which was a 48 track. And they just psh, went under because of COVID. And they're still under. And um, so I haven't been able to get back over there. So I've been trying to find something that's comparable to this studio I was working with because we still have to finish. Uh, we're almost close to finishing. I have just to, to do some leads and some backgrounds and we're done. And of course, I have some songs that me and Bernie worked on before he passed about songs about eight or nine years old when we started doing them. They're just as funky as they were uh, from the day we started on it. And honored to have that there's three songs that bernie and i did together i did one with uh jesse johnson from the time actually we did two we did i betcha which is another story on that one on that mix i wasn't happy about the mix and so that one got kind of like psh, squashed but um there he gave me a, a couple other tracks that are really great so we got to finish those another guy named john bell who's uh, my music director my md gave me a really incredible track called there ain't no funk on the radio that one's bad as heck that is a really bad bad track and we're just about this far from finishing it and then the one called stand up for the funky folks still here still standing for the funk that's a beast and that one has got bernie on there noodling all around on it and that one just needs some uh two verses and it's done is it so, yeah, next year uh, I plan on releasing those six tracks and then um, go from there to see if uh, for some other ones that I have that's just been sitting in the can for quite some time. It's just time to release them. Good thing about them is just that they're funk, you know, t timeless, you know. They just, uh, that's what the funk is. They just never age. They never age. So, yeah. Those are the unreleased songs that I still I'm still I still have in the can in the can. Yeah, well, definitely been teased with some of those snippets that you've uh, yeah, I, on I Facebook. You know, yeah, I, yeah. yeah I, I gotta stop doing it. <laughs> I get all excited and you know, right be like be, right before COVID, yeah, 2019. I started like, guess what we're doing over here? I want everybody here. It's so bad. And then this is like some like psh, COVID just shut everything down, just wiped it out. Didn't help that I got COVID too, and that set me back at least almost a year. I was one of those long termers, right? So, whew, so I'm back to you know back. Got my little, got my funk badge, and I pinned it on my chest, and back out there, you know, standing in the on the funk line down in the trenches, trying to keep the art form alive. And whatever happened to the material that was going to be that aborted solo album? Uh out of the total experience uh, situation, did you have? Oh, the, the, the Charlie Wilson stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's so personal, and I listened to it. It's just, <clears throat> it wasn't the funk, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a. Uh, it sounded like a, kind of a cross between Gap Band and P Funk, kind of. Um, there's about maybe three of those songs because I I walked with all the masters. I still have the masters. It's just something's missing. I don't know. Um, there's a possibility that I probably might release one or two of them. There's there, yeah, there's one called Can We Be Lovers, which is one thing about Can We Be Lovers that had a atomic dog loop through it, you know. So that's that's basically I have to give credit to George Clinton for that one. And then there's another one called uh, uh, Jam Into the Break of Dawn, and that one was uh written by a guy named jimmy macon who was the in, uh, lead guitar player for the gap band so those two yeah there's a possibility that i might do something with those jury's still out i'm not sure yet all right well you know how my vote is for all of it so i know you want to hear i know you want to i know yeah yeah um so how can uh, people best keep up with everything don silva moving into 2024 well, Instagram for one, and then DawnSilva.com. We, we try to keep stuff up with the subscribers that come in, and we try to keep up with the uh, with the uh, daily things that are going on. And so I think next year with the, uh, with the streaming, um, the marketing, the, the global streaming uh, deals, and now they can also not only stream, but they can download these singles now. So um, 
with the six songs that I do plan on dropping next year and the Brides of Funkenstein basically doing more shows, uh, we'll kind of see, you know, I'll put it on, on the, on the list, uh, on the prayers list. You know, I believe that I put God first and everything. It's, it's his decision. You so I'm just, I'm just a co-pilot over here. He's the pilot. How, whatever, whatever God's will is, if he's, if it's in his will for me to go out and do Brides of Funkenstein shows across the country, then I will be doing that. I'm going to put it into play. And if that's, if it's meant to happen, then it will. So that's where we are on that one. Any chance of a, of a movie? Well, they're doing what you call a biopic, biopic, biopic. They're working on that. Right. Uh, but I really can't, I don't want to jinx myself. I promise you, I do not want to jinx myself. So I'm, I'll wait to see, but I have a feeling that, yeah, there's, there's going to definitely be um, some films popping up out of this book. I really believe that. I hope so. What a fantastic story. And, and congratulations, Don, and all the success with it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. And I and thank you for your patience for uh, waiting. And I, I believe I'm glad that I did because everything happens for a reason. And I be, I'm glad that there is so much to talk about now, now that we waited to do this interview. And uh, hopefully we can um, hook back up again six months down the line. And, you know, like I said, God willing, you know, it's, it's, it's up to him to decide. He's the deciding factor. Um, and we'll see where we go from here. Absolutely. But, but I'm going to always be down here in the trenches with, with the funk soldiers, always. We all got each other's back, you know? Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. I do believe that, and I believe that. I, I really appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I do want to give a shout-out to to Amuka Kelly, Sheila Horn, uh, um, Jeanette Magruder, Lynn, Malia Franklin, Debbie Wright, Jeanette Washington, Shirley Hayden, Jessica Cleve, Cheryl James, um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Belita Woods to these these thoroughbreds, these these stallions, these funk warriors, these funk priests. Shauna Hall is another one that I want to give a shout out to. Um, while we're talking about Shauna Hall, Shauna Hall and I are actually collaborating on a new book. Uh, it's an audio music book, and none of first of its kind. And uh, she's also, you know, Shauna Hall's from the Four Non Blonde and played the. Uh, guitar with George and those guys for a while. Phenomenal songwriter, right? So we started actually putting together some songs that she had in the can and then some other ones that I have to put this uh this 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 sci it's a fiction, this sci-fi book together. Uh that is I'm really excited about that one. I'm looking at probably 2025 for that one. I was, ho I was hopefully hopeful that it would happen in the beginning of the year, but so many other things came before that project, but that we're, we're just going to start working on that in February. So it's a, it's a sequel to a film as well. It's a, it's a, it's a book. It's nowhere near as big as the, the funk queen at all, but the story is similar to around those, those, uh, 13 funk female soldiers that I just mentioned. I think there's 13. My, my, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, th this characters of each individual of them coming from another planet, Nebula Star. So Nebula Star is a song that probably will be in this book. It, it's a song book. It is. Nebula Star was the lead vocalist on that is Belita Woods. And the lyrics, and I'm going to leave you with this. Nebula Star is... Nebula star, hang on to your priceless jewels of wisdom. Keep them in a shiny box and you must hold them close or you'll see your diamonds turn to dust. So this is a story about these powerful women that came from a planet called Nebula star. And it's a, it's a it's pretty deep. It's fiction, but um, based on true facts, but then I made it fiction so everybody can be protected here. <laughs> but it's a that's a new project that Sean and I are working on. We have, haven't been able to talk about it over the last year because we were still putting all the particulars together, but now it's definitely going to happen. So I'm 
God willing, I'm, I'm thankful that that's the next one of the next big major projects that we're working on together. And that is, again, funk, very much funk and very much rock. Sounds and really interesting. And yeah. you're, you're, you're familiar with the Four Non Blonde, right? Mm-hmm. That group? Yeah, so. All yeah, right. so really happy about that. Well, good luck with that and everything you got going. And uh, stay healthy above everything else. Oh, yeah. That's your wealth is your health. And I'm going to try mm-hmm. as, as, as much as I can, yeah, to stay eat right and not be turning into a senior citizen <laughs> slowly. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, don't be a stranger. Thank you, Scott. And call me anytime. And I I cannot wait to see this one. And thank you for the the questions. And thank you for talking about uh, things in the book that no one else, no one else has talked about. I really, really do appreciate that. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing. to the rhythm of the one.